Hey guys, Nathan Duck River Honey, and this is going to be number 12 in my series on building a bee business. I thought I would do something a little different this week by just going through all of my bee yards and giving you a real quick update on what I'm doing, uh, everything I've got going on. So this is a nuke yard. This is my first round of nukes that I made in spring. So anyway, my plan for these nukes is to feed, 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 split, split, split. I need maybe a uh, hundred queens more than what I've got right now. And I need somewhere to rob all that from. So I'm thinking I can invest into these girls uh, just a, a bunch of feed and get what I need from them. They like that Pierco foundation. These are actually Pierco frames. Yeah, they, they like that really well. So I've got six uh, production colonies in this yard. I've split out of these twice now, most of them. The one on the left, uh, it was only two or three medium frames of bees coming out of winter, and they've built up to a really good population. Now, they're going to make a honey crop, but I had to swap them with another hive to trade foragers out, and then I've equalized into them a couple times. But I graded that queen to make sure that she was worth the effort, and... Uh, as soon as she got some bees in there, she started laying. So she's got a good pattern, doing a good job. She just didn't have a lot of bee power to start spraying with. You can see I'm adding some ventilation to these. Bob Benny thinks that that helps with swarming. I think it, uh, I don't know, it might. I'm gonna find out. I think it almost certainly is gonna help them dry honey down. This is one of my drone flooding yards, but I think it's gonna be a pretty decent honey yard too. I've got room to grow into this yard. I think I've got 20 spots. I've got six hives in here right now. I can put more than that in if I need to. Oh yeah, we've got some nectar. Man, that's good. That's got some locust in it, but it's got something else too. It's got that real floral, but then it's got a tang. That's good. That's really good. It's not poplar. Poplar's blooming right now, but that, it may have a little bit of poplar in it, but not a lot. 
They can make all that they want to. I'll, I'll take a lot of that. That's good stuff. I tasted some wild cherry a couple weeks ago. I'm glad they didn't store much of that. I think they ate it up in brood production. It's um, very medicinal. It's, I, I don't know, it's hard to explain. It, it's sort of like a cough syrup or even an iodine flavor or something. It's uh, very medicinal. So this is my current mating yard. I've got uh, 27. I think I've got 27 nukes in here right now. These are all Corey Stevens queens, virgins, that I'm um, trying to get mated. I put them in here a week ago and I would desperately like to peek in and um, just check on them, but I'm not going to. I'm not gonna mess with them until next week. I'd also like to feed them because I gave them a gallon when I put them in it, when I installed them here. And uh, they're probably out by now, but again, I don't want to disturb them uh, for two weeks at least. And, you know, when they're when that queen's in there trying to get mated and then established and you just don't wanna, don't wanna mess around with them. So I'm not going to. That's one advantage of using bucket feeders over hive top or over in hive feeders. You know, if they were, if they had bucket feeders on them, I could just swap out the bucket feeders and not disturb the colonies, get them some feed, get them growing, stimulated, happy, all that. Um, you can do the same with jars, but um, I'm not set up to do that yet, but I will be soon. This little black locust is just getting ready to bloom. Some of the bigger ones are already in bloom. That's my great grandfather's house. He passed in the early 1960s, so it's been abandoned since then. I've got this little yard here. I mowed this this morning, and I'm gonna turn this into my new mating yard. With all these terrain features and stumps and trees and buildings and junk <laughs> it should be really good it's like honeysuckles blooming i saw snowbell american snowbell blooming earlier i don't know if bees use that or not but i saw a bunch of it so that mating yard i just took you to works great it's south facing it's in a dog leg of the tree line so the wind doesn't get too bad there i really like that but I am beating a two track on the edge of the hay field. My, no, my neighbors are nice enough to let me use it and I feel bad because I'm putting a two track on it. Boy, that honeysuckle there is this bush honeysuckle. Eventually I'm gonna have to make another drone flooding yard to the south. I've got three drone flooding yards now and this mating yard I've already got is right in the center of all three of them but this new mating yard is sort of to the south center of those three and I really want to have another mating yard about a mile south of there just to give really good coverage so I'm trying to get some VSH genetics and start breeding for that I think my smart path on that is to use the VSH virgins I got from Corey, 
uh, Stevens that are in my mating yard and just get them grown up into adult hives this year and then stick a bunch of drone comb into them in January or February and let them make drones and populate my drone flooding yards with those hives and then maybe get a breeder queen next spring and uh, ii or ai however you want to put it artificially inseminated breeder queen uh, from somebody next spring and then i can sort of begin to control uh, the mother line and the father line because those virgins are going to outcross with my bees and i like my bees they're very hardy i have good winter survival here they're easy to work with they do well with my management but I want to promote that VSH trait. And um, the way you do that is take those virgins whose drones are going to be almost pure VSH. You know, they're gonna have most of the alleles. And then you take a AI breeder and make your queen, use that as your queen mother, and then uh, cross them using drone flooding yards to those um, VSH virgins that I got. So that's sort of what I'm thinking for next year. We'll we'll see how that goes. Plans are subject to change at a moment's notice. <laughs> I'm here in my home yard and uh, let's see how many we got here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four. Got 24 colonies in here, and of those, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, maybe 17 of them are gonna make honey. Uh, the ones that are in threes or below probably won't, although this one down here, I did split them down. The queen was not doing well. I split them down and then merged a nuke in with them. Got them into two boxes, fed them a gallon or two of syrup and put an excluder and a uh, honey super on top. So they might make a honey crop out of two mediums as a, as a high body. We'll see. This yard's making honey right now. It's similar to the, the last one that I showed you the honey frame on. It, it's very similar honey. We've got a nuke here, a nuke there, and a nuke on top. The top one is the old queen. I'm using her to build that out, and then I'll split off of it and use it up when I'm doing more queen rearing. The middle box is a grafted queen, and I think they may have made an, an emergency queen in the bottom. The horizontal is looking pretty strong. A lot of bee flight. And as far as I can tell, the old swarm catching tree has been barren this year. I've caught a lot of swarms on that tree, but I've split everybody down so hard this year, I've not seen a single swarm. I'm, I need to knock on wood. I know that I'll have four, 14 issue today, but just because I said that, this is my storm blown yard. You see that looks a little odd there that's a screen bottom board and when that hive got knocked over it popped the screen loose so now they're using the bottom as an entrance i need to um, i need to replace that it's getting tall enough now that it's a chore i don't really want to set them back because we're past hardwood green up here we're into the flow see all the bees coming in low kind of coming in beneath the landing board that usually means they've got full bellies so this is an out yard that um, can't mate with my other yards I had close to 20 hives in here last fall and I robbed it to populate my drone flooding yards I took the best out of here and left the ones that were a little feistier like that one and that monster up there but took the best and uh, 
populated my drone floating yards. This yard is really shady. It's down in a hollow, lots of trees. I have more high beetle pressure here, but I noticed that the bees just didn't build up as fast in spring. So lesson learned, if you want to make bees in the spring, keep them in sunny yards. And if you want to make honey and you want them to grow a little slower, shady yards might be better for that. Your wing wrestling. Easy girls. I'm here to help you. So it looks like we've got some foundation in there. Can't tell if they're starting to work on that or not. Some complete frames that they are definitely frosting i see that white colored wax being drawn out so they're on a little bit of a flow looks like i don't normally work these hives out here with just a veil i have started working more and more without gloves though i'm getting stung frequently doing that but i'm not sure that i see that as a bad thing anymore sort of a risk management. Oh yeah, definitely are on a flow. That's good honey, but not great honey. I don't know what that is. It's very different from the the other yard I, I tasted. Very different. It's got more sweet. It's got a little bit of earthiness to it. It doesn't have the tangy finish. It doesn't have the floral notes. I would say that one is fair to good. I mean, it's a good table honey, but um, it's not a great honey. That last stuff uh, in the other yard, that I would say that's a, a great honey. This hive has got a history of being big in population and grumpy. But the same hive has requeened itself and made honey for three years in a row and hasn't swarmed. So there's something to be said for that. <laughs> yeah, we got bees up here in the super. I don't see them doing a lot though. Nice big wheel bug there. I think that's what that is. So I've got frosting on the top bars here. They're packing nectar in. Mostly side to side. Then they haven't come up to there yet. They haven't come over into the corners. Let's pull one of those and look at it. That's the same honey I've got at that other yard. Definitely. That tastes like it's got some poplar in it though. The color isn't really red enough to be poplar. Maybe it's a mix of locust and poplar. I don't know, it's got that tanginess to it. That's good, that's really good. 
Yeah. You girls should tell the other bees where to find that at. All right guys, so I spent some time on the walk through the bee yard portion, so I'm gonna try to make this portion of the video um, a little quicker. Week in review, this week I did a lot of wax dipping. I uh, actually had a, a gentleman come by yesterday and pick up an entire pallet of equipment that I wax dipped for him. So got a lot done. I did all that in one day. Uh, what I did is I heated the tank on day one with just one burner. I have three pipe burners under it. He did the tank on day one, got it all liquefied, shut it off. And then the next morning, since there was a, you know, a ball of liquid wax still in the center of that tank, since there's 500 plus pounds in there, uh, it didn't take very long at all turning two burners on and then three burners on to get the whole tank up to temperature. So I was wax dipping by 9.30 in the morning and didn't eat lunch, had to leave at 2.30 to go get the kids came back, let my dad watch them and worked for another hour and got everything finished up. So um, I think I ended up, I don't have any idea how much I did it. It filled two and a half pallets, three pallets. Yeah, three pallets. I did three pallets worth of equipment, however much that comes out to, that's what I did in that amount of time. So it, it was a hustle. I was sore the next day. It's, you know, a lot of upper body stuff, lifting up and over and good shoulder exercise, back exercise. So I didn't need no gym membership this week. We'll put it that way. Got all my hive work done early in the week, which was good. Uh, nukes, my first round of nukes are looking good. They're growing. I need them to grow because I need to split them and rob them blind of, of brood. <laughs> Poor things. Uh, they're going to be used up by the, by the end of the season, but I need, I need to make more bees. Uh, honey flow is going on and good news. The uh, weatherman, uh, took some rain out of the forecast. So we were going to have like four or five days in the next week that had a 60 plus percent chance of rain. And that is not good for tulip poplar. Um, you know, we've got tulip poplar and black locust coming into bloom. Tulip poplar is actually in bloom. Black locust is just getting going, which is odd because it's usually a week before tulip poplar. Things are blooming out of order this season uh, uh, to a large extent. I had apples still blooming when the first tulip poplars opened up. It's odd. Uh, but anyway, the tulip poplar blooms are kind of like that on top of the trees. They're hard to see. They're, they're mostly green. They have a, um, some orange on them as well. But since they're upward facing, the rain washes the nectar out of that bloom. Whereas the, um, the black locust is in the, the pea family, the legume family. So it's got sort of a little bell shaped flower in clusters and um, you know, it's downward facing. So rain, gentle rain doesn't affect the black locust as much as it does tulip poplar but the black locust is delicate. So if you get a windstorm, then all the blossoms will be laying on the ground the next morning. So um, hopefully we get some warm, dry, calm weather for the next three weeks. We get just enough rain and it's gentle rain and only at night. That, that, would, be, that would be perfect, but we don't ever get what we want. <laughs> I've also been doing a lot of editing this week. I've had so much footage from uh, the Corey Stevens trip to get caught up on. I've got a bunch of field work that I've been doing that I don't know what I'm gonna do with because it's getting old now. Um, I'm gonna have to post some kind of catch up video or something. I don't, I don't have time to get through with everything. So I'm a little behind on that. So coming up, um, I'll tell you where I'm at in the season. I just drove out to my home bee yard here and parked my truck next to it and watched the bees fly. I haven't done that this year, I don't think. I've been so busy that I haven't felt like I had any breathing room to just in, enjoy the bees. Um, you know, in years past, I've done that often. I, I really enjoy watching the bees fly on a sunny afternoon when there's a flow going on. And uh, since we've gotten into the flow, the swarming pressure has gone down. I'll run through everybody again next week and uh, you know, just tip boxes, make sure I'm not seeing any swarming signs. But hopefully that pressure is going to drastically reduce and 
I have finally got enough stock of equipment put together and ready to go. I've got an entire pallet out here. Um, I think it's um, six across and then you know eight or nine high of boxes with frames and foundations ready to go. I've still got a few drawn supers and then some partially drawn supers ready to go. So I feel like I've got a handle on the equipment front right now. A little bit of breathing room there. A little bit of breathing room on the swarming. Um, so now I need to jump into the honey house and, and get that knocked out. I was actually going to jump into the honey house today, but I ended up editing video. At, you know, as soon as the wife and kids left this morning, I've been doing that until now. Um, and now I've got to finish this video and get it edited so it can go out this afternoon. Uh, it is what it is. Next week, I'm probably going to set up another uh, cell builder. I actually took a hive that looked a little swarmy uh, earlier in the week. I think on the 20th or 21st or 23rd, somewhere in there. I'd have to look at the lid. And it was four mediums tall, so I stuck a queen excluder in the middle of it. Uh, so two on the bottom, two on the top. And that will let me say where the queen is. She's either going, she's going to be in, you know, two of those four boxes, either or. And then I can uh, turn the, make whichever part is queenless into a queenless cell starter with the queen on top. So I'll probably do another round of grafting there and get some splits started. Um, I'm also planning to pick up some Caucasian queens from Shabu Raj. He's got some uh, genetics that are very similar to what Bob Benny's running, a Caucasian carny uh, type B. And I want to bring some of that in and, and play around with it, uh, which will be fun. Uh, so I've got to get some splits ready and aged out. Uh, I'm a big fan of having no brood young enough in a split that they can make an emergency queen. Uh, get, a, get much better results if they just don't have an option to make an emergency queen. They take whatever cell you give them, they take virgin queen, they take whatever hope you give them. So I need to get some stuff set up so that uh, I can let it start aging on top of an, an excluder. I'd like to say thanks to Dale Brown and Russell Koopman. Uh, both of them donated to the channel. I really appreciate it, guys. It, it does help. It really does. So the question this week comes from Dave Rowden. He says, great video like always. One question. What do you plan on doing with all the empty supers to preserve the comb during the off season? Uh, that's a good question, Dave. And I'm probably going to do two or three different things. And I've got thoughts going forward. Uh, first thing is... I am using excluders on top of my fourth medium this year so that the fifth and anything above it is going to be free of brood. And when I get to extraction, I'm going to separate uh, honeycomb from any comb that's had brood in it. So, uh, you know, if I'm pulling boxes that have had brood at, in them in some, at some point, like the fourths, then I will pull any frames out that have had brood and make boxes of just brood. I may use all of that up in summer splits. I may not. If I store any of that during the off season, it will certainly uh, be treated with paramoth. I'm, I'd also like to experiment with sertan. Uh, that, sertan is a biological treatment. It's actually a bacterium that is harmless to bees. It's harmless to people and it doesn't hurt the honey in any way. There's no chemical residue. The problem with Sertan is application. I've got some, um, some ideas on how I can manage that so that it's easy. Basically, I would apply it right as it's coming out of the extractor. I'm thinking I could have a tank uh, of water with Sertan mixed in and just dip the honey frame down in that, shake it off a little, and put it in a box. Um, and I'm going to try that. I'm going to experiment with it. I haven't used it before and comb is so valuable that I'm not willing to run a mass experiment that could cost me a lot of money. So I want to do like 10 or 20 boxes and overwinter them and get the process figured out and figure out if it's going to work or not before I actually implement that in the whole operation. But if it works and I can get it to be efficient in applying, that would be wonderful. 
Now circling back to the honeycomb, boxes of just honeycomb, I have no wax moth pressure in those at all. Um, you know, you'll get ants and stuff in them, you'll get mice in them um, if you allow that to happen, but I don't get wax moth pressure in just honeycomb, it's just the brood comb they go after. Your mileage may vary, but I will be more lax in applying paramoth crystals or sertan or, or whatever on honeycomb than I would on brood comb. Now, what a lot of the big guys would do is they would have shipping containers and they would stack their honey supers in the shipping containers and then they would have a applicator's license to use um, phosphine which is a poisonous gas uh, they use it to fumigate grain bins so it is food safe once you know a certain amount of hours have passed there is no residue whatsoever from this they they fumigate wheat and you know things that go into bread and he, things for human consumption with it so it's very safe once it's dissipated, but you can kill yourself real quick with that stuff. You can kill kids real quick. You can kill people real quick with it. So you've got to know what you're doing with that. Um, I don't really want to use that, but uh, boy, it would be efficient if you start getting to the point where you've got hundreds or thousands of honey supers that you want to make sure there are no mice, there are no roaches, there are no wax moth, there are no ants, there are no nothing alive in this space with your comb. You know, you close it up, throw, you know, throw the tabs in, close it up, lock the doors, put warning signs on there, and you're done until spring. Um, that's pretty efficient, but um, that's an option for bigger players. I don't think I want to mess with that. I, the, the, the downside risks are just big, really big. So coming up on the channel, I've got a video with Corey Stevens on the Harbo assay. I, I've got a lot of talking and good content, good conversation uh, from the, the inside portion of, of my trip with him. And all of that is not in this video. I tried to keep this short and to the point. It's in a digestible bite and it's got a lot of visuals, good, good solid content. Um, that way if anybody is looking at how to do VSH testing or how to do the Harbo assay, they can get just this instead of a longer form uh, podcast type video. So that's going to post uh, tomorrow morning. And then I'm probably not gonna have a video for Sunday morning because today is my 11th anniversary. And tomorrow I've got a cleanup day at the family cemetery. And tomorrow evening I've got a scouts camping trip with my son. So uh, I don't see how I'm gonna have time to get any more editing done this, this weekend. Uh, but I'll probably have another video with Corey um, just to, a conversational more you know the podcast video type uh, bits and pieces of good information type video and then like i said i've got a bunch of field work that i have filmed that i just have not had time to do anything with so i need to i need to catch up on that i'm working on a video on the wax dip tank i filmed some of that uh, the other day when i was working but it's hard to be on the clock just bam 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 you know you've got things going like an assembly line and also think about camera management and audio and what i'm saying to the camera so i sort of film the process but i don't know how chaotic and bad that part of it's going to be so i'll probably have to do a bench portion and then cover a lot of those detailed questions while i can actually focus on that so that'll probably be coming up next week or the week after Guys, as always, if you've got any questions, leave them in the comments below. You can also email me at info at duckriverhoney.com. Try to answer one or two a week. I appreciate you watching. I'll see you on the next one.